Welcome, dear viewers, to our second broadcast regarding the study of ghasts. As you well know, the recent discovery of dried ghasts, and by extension, ghastlings and happy ghasts, sent waves through the scientific community. Now that some time has passed, the Institute has been able to research more specimens. In this video, we'll explain what we learned and reevaluate some of our previous theories. We wanted to start this episode by looking specifically at gas biology. As always, we'll begin with what we know. Ghasts are most likely soft-bodied creatures, given their high vulnerability to physical attacks and their overall squishy appearance. Despite the locational correlation between natural dried ghasts and ancient fossils, we do not believe they possess any sort of skeletal structure. Being an invertebrate with nine tentacles, we feel safe assuming that they belong to the phylum Nidaria, a taxonomic group that contains jellyfish and anemones, among others. While searching for previous research, we found a study that classified the ghast as M. reincarnata, referencing their apparent ability to reincarnate, a theory we discussed in our previous broadcast. It should be noted that this classification was made before the discovery of the dried ghast, and some taxonomists are currently debating how to classify the happy ghast. The point is, evidence suggests that the ghast is some kind of jellyfish, or is at the very least closely related to them. But on to another big question of ghast biology, flight. What is the biological mechanism by which ghasts take flight? They have no wings, there's no reason to suspect any sort of magical element. A very popular theory in the community is that ghasts function like hot air balloons, regulating warm air to float around. After careful consideration, we believe evidence supports this claim. Ghasts are very vocal creatures, with most of their noises consisting of shrieks or screams, vocalizations that require airflow, as opposed to a more deep rumble or something like a rattlesnake tail. Furthermore, if we look carefully when a nether ghast shoots a fireball, we see the underside of the creature turns black, along with other parts of the mob, almost like vents opening up. The ghast can create the fire charge and propel it, but must intake more air to maintain flight. There are a few discrepancies to address. In truth, there are many puzzling differences between the nether ghast and their newly discovered happy counterpart. Nether ghasts are aggressive, shoot fireballs, and are fireproof, and produce gas tears and gunpowder. The happy ghast does not possess any of these qualities. The basic function remains the same. Ghasts fly by intaking air through the bottom and heating it up. The tentacles surround the intake membrane and may help filter dust or generally just protect a more vulnerable area. The creatures change altitude by venting air through these gill-like structures on their sides. Since both can fly, it's safe to assume that they generate heat to warm the air internally, which could mean it's more difficult for them to fly in the nether. This could account for nether ghasts flying into the ground more often, though we have no numerical data to confirm this and behavioral studies have not been conducted fully. As for the other differences, we do believe both specimens are the same species, and it is that the ghast has a remarkably high phenotypic plasticity. In short, this means that they are able to adapt very well to different climates or environments. They can alter the expression of certain genes based on external factors. For example, the tear. When a happy ghast is damaged, it will eventually heal itself with no input required. That is, unlike some other mobs, it will eventually fully heal, even in the absence of food. So the regenerative ability is present, but not very strong. When subjected to a harsher set of conditions, this regenerative ability is enhanced, leading to the ghast producing the ghast tear. It's certainly not uncommon for some animals to produce special enzymes or compounds under stress to help them survive. In a similar vein, the ability to synthesize and shoot fireballs, in addition to fire resistance, is likely an adaptation as a result of living in the nether. Within our own overworld, there's plenty of precedent that shows animals can adapt to harsh conditions. Furthermore, nether ghasts are substantially weaker than their happy counterparts, not to mention their sad expressions and crying. This would suggest that ghasts are not native to the nether. So the question from our previous broadcast remains, how did they get here? Since evidence supports that ghasts are not very happy in this hellscape, we can safely say they didn't willingly come here. And it could have been accidental, but we believe there is a better answer. It's well known that the gas tear is one of the most useful alchemical compounds in existence, used for potions of regeneration, and the end crystal may be the most powerful artifact in the known world. But the gas can only produce this compound in the inhospitable, high-stress environments of the nether. There are many ancient civilizations in our world and beyond, we believe that the ghasts may have been brought to the nether by these ancient civilizations. Perhaps they were originally used as we use them now, to fly around and transport cargo. But once the tear and its properties were discovered, 
guasps were brought to the nether to be farmed, to essentially be placed in a high-stress environment to induce tear production, and then killed. This would also explain their extreme aggression towards people, a generational instinct or a harsh memory of how they were betrayed by mankind. When we restore them to their natural state and habitat, they may realize that they are being saved and we do not intend to harm them. Additionally, this makes more sense than our previous zombification theory, and indeed, researchers have brought happy ghasts to the nether with no zombification occurring. If a happy ghast was brought to the nether or a nether ghast brought to the overworld, hypothetically, given enough time, they would turn into their counterpart. Again, regarding our previous broadcast, there are many researchers at the Institute that now believe there is more evidence to support the tier farm theory than the automaton theory. This does not solve all questions, however. Returning to biology, where do ghasts actually come from? In our previous video, we operated some of our theories off the assumption that ghasts could breed after consuming snow, or water, their food. However, we now know that this is not the case. We know that we can generate a new ghast by combining a tear and soul sand, but this probably isn't where they originally came from, especially if the tears are produced within the ghasts themselves, which equates to a what came first, the chicken or the egg situation. Some believe that ghasts are not true animals per se, but are chimera manifestations controlled by the souls trapped in the sands. This still doesn't solve the tear origin, however. Instead, we believe the soul energy acts as a catalyst, providing the activation energy required for cellular generation, rather than the spirit itself being in control. There is precedent for this as well. The power of souls is certainly known in our world, used to enchant weapons, and is believed to be a key component in more sinister magical practice. However, these dark magics are outlawed for the most part, so we can only speculate for now. In short, we still do not know how ghasts reproduce, but given their potential jellyfish ancestry, there's a chance it may be asexual, and we should clarify again that the generation from a tear and soul sand is not reproduction proper, as only one new ghast is created from the tears of several others, meaning if this was how they reproduced, the number of ghasts could only go down. It doesn't make sense. With the new evidence we've outlined, some of our old theories still hold up. The ghasts were originally from the overworld or someplace else, but were brought to the nether against their will. In a tragic twist of fate, the original native population is now extinct, leaving only the ghasts in the nether. Perhaps they can still reproduce here, and there are ancient legends and stories that make note of baby ghasts, but piglins aren't known for their record keeping and something may have been lost in translation from an ancient version of the villagers' current language. In any case, we at the Institute have not observed anything that would directly confirm this. Like we discussed previously, it seems like the ghasts we find in the nether are ancient, barely clinging on over the centuries. Those who don't make it end up here. On the subject of lab-grown dried ghasts, whether or not they hold the memories of their donors is unclear. These discoveries have raised ethical questions regarding industry. Hunting of nether ghasts has increased tenfold, and while happy ghasts have returned to the overworld for the first time in centuries, are we falling into the same pitfalls as the ancient civilizations? As before, the science is very new, and as always, research is ongoing. If you have notes, or any other studies you'd like to share, please let us know in the comments. And of course, feel free to let us know what you'd like the Institute to document next. If you'd like to support our work, consider liking and subscribing. Thank you so much for watching, and till next time.